Let me set the scene for uh, this, uh, this panel. Over the next 60 seconds, approximately 2 million people around the globe will search for something on Google. 1.8 million posts will be liked on Facebook. 278,000 tweets will be sent, at least a few of which I hope will emerge from this conference. 570 websites will go live online for the first time and more than 200 million emails will be sent. And of course, countless articles in the traditional media, both broadcast and print, will also be written. Now, while most of us contribute to these numbers minute by minute without giving it a second thought, our panel today will address the millions of people who are denied free and unfettered access to both the traditional media and, of course, the new media tools and all the freedoms they provide. And we'll discuss the regimes which use all of these forms of media as a means to oppress and control their own people and what implications this has on our understanding of what's happening in countries uh, such as the ones we'll be talking about today. Now, the stark reality is only 15% of the world's citizens live in free countries uh, or countries that enjoy a free press. That's an astonishing number. We see the manifestations in some of the Middle Eastern countries that we talked about uh, earlier today, but also in countries like China and Russia. So consider, for example, something that Cliff had mentioned that Reporters Without Borders lists Turkey as the world's biggest prison for journalists, or Qatar, where journalists are subject to prosecution for criticizing the Qatari government, the ruling family, or even Islam. In Iran, well, we'll have a very rich conversation about that and Iran's media in, in just a minute. And in Egypt, just weeks ago, Bassam Youssef, who many of you know is a comedian regarding, regarded as Egypt's version of Jon Stewart, had his show pulled off the air a week after he poked fun at the country's military. And just last week, as Ambassador Haqqani will no doubt discuss, the offices of Express Media Group, a leading news organization, were faced with open fire yet again, not the first time, uh, by un unnamed gunmen. Very interestingly enough, the CEO of the uh, news group said, you know what, they're journalists. They're used to such stuff. And I suppose to a certain degree that might be true because since 9-11, over 100 reporters have been killed in Pakistan. You know, have they been adequately investigated? Is, are these sorts of things taken seriously? Now, of course, there are select Western journalists who are able to report from Tehran and Karachi and other such capitals. But it, is Western media being manipulated by who gets visas and hotel versus who lands in prisons? I'd like to kick off the conversation uh, first with a couple of questions for you, Ambassador Haqqani. First of all, Ambassador Haqqani has had a fascinating and remarkable career as a journalist, as a media fixer, a professor, and as Pakistan's distinguished ambassador to the United States. First of all, Ambassador Haqqani, you no doubt could relate to uh, many of the scenarios I mentioned, right? First, you were on The Daily Show with the John Stewart on Monday night, just two nights ago, and openly uh, critique your government and ours. And guess what? You are here today and are free to continue to do that. And no doubt, you had a shameless plug of your book, which I will continue to do right here. <laughs> Ambassador Haqqani's wonderful new book is called Magnificent Delusions and copies are available for purchase and signing in the lobby right after. <laughs> Two questions. Can you briefly kick off the conversation by describing the media environment in Pakistan today and you know, what it means for Pakistani's ability to understand what's happening throughout the country? First of all, let me just begin by saying that not only Pakistan, but the entire greater Middle East, the no, uh, well, what is generally uh, understood to be the Middle East, the Arab part of the world, uh, uh, Arab part as well as Turkey, Iran, uh, and then Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia. Uh, these are regions where narratives matter. And the media is essentially used by different forces as a narrative building or narrative reinforcing uh, instrument. It's not a means of, uh, first of all, conveying facts as 
different people see them or even opinions as different people see them. So what you have in Pakistan essentially and now increasingly in other parts, Egypt being one of those places, um, is an attempt to cry, create an illusion of diversity of the media while maintaining effective control. So it's no longer the Izvestia Pravda model, you know, just the government controls the newspaper directly. The government doesn't. The government turns around and says every media outlet except one is, is privately owned. But the people who are given the licenses to run television channels, the people who own the newspapers, then the fact that most newspapers are owned by companies and businesses that are closely connected and whose businesses depend upon the government, uh, and especially in countries where there's a deep state like Pakistan, the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence represents the country's deep state, it enables you to create parameters in which you will have the freedom. So you're free, free to criticize a few corrupt deals of uh, civilian politicians. Uh, you're free to raise a few questions about drones. Uh, but you are not allowed the kind of freedom of being able to ask fundamental questions. And uh, wh why have 100 journalists been killed? They've been killed either by the Taliban or Pakistan's deep state, all for raising questions that were too uncomfortable. Pakistan's military headquarters were attacked by the terrorists. Anywhere else that would have resulted in dozens of uh, uh, sort of articles for trying to find out who was behind the plot, what happened. Pakistan's prime, uh, uh, main nuclear scientist was accused of selling nuclear technology to third countries, um, which is essentially a crime or should have been deemed to be a crime. Uh, any investigative journalism in Pakistan? Not really. Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, yours truly, was falsely accused of passing on a memorandum to American officials, essentially making promises that he wasn't authorized to and which would be untenable uh, in the Pakistani context. And yet, the reverse happened. The entire media for several days just ran, you know, this is what happened. Nobody looked through uh, what was supposed to be the evidence to say there is no uh, sort of, you know, be fair. Um, so this manipulation is, 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 is what essentially is the situation there. There are brave journalists, they push the envelope to the best of their ability, but uh, the Pakistani uh, Supreme Court has ruled that uh, questioning the ideology of Pakistan is not allowed. So I'm kind of out now because, uh, you know, if you, if you notice, even while talking on the John Stewart sort of daily show, um, I basically make the point, why can't I question what has been described as the ideology of Pakistan by some people? There may have been need to have an ideology when Pakistan was being created, but 95% of Pakistanis today are people who were born after the creation of Pakistan. I'm a Pakistani because I was born a Pakistani. I don't need a raison d'etre for Pakistan. I just want to figure out how to run Pakistan better. So why can't we discuss policy without ideology? And that ideological framework is virtually imposed. And anybody who goes off the reservation from the point of view of the deep state, uh, their wings are clipped, uh, either by running campaigns at home. So the biggest gap you will notice is if you do a study, and I hope that out of this conference, the FDD will actually get into this path. And I'm offering my own services to help you guys uh, get that together, is kind of a full study country by country of the media scenes, how people there see their own country or are made to see their own country, and how the rest of the world sees them and how the rest of the world understands them. So in Pakistan, very few people see terrorism the way the rest of the world sees it. Very few people see Pakistan's nuclear program and issues connected with it like others do. Everybody is made to see it as India has nukes, why can't we? Yes, of course you can and you should for your own security if you feel that. However, they have to be subject to the same international sort of considerations that others' as nuclear programs are and nobody else has been running a nuclear black market uh, like your guy did. So understand that. And that is just doesn't, it is not allowed to happen. Uh, Pakistan's major physicist, uh, physicist uh, Parvez Hudboy, He's been described as an American agent, a, an atheist, et cetera, et cetera, by other media. So you will have that situation really little here. I mean, yes, I know, you know, everybody now and then 
calls each other names on their blogs, but there's no way that there will be a concentrated or concerted effort by some segment of the media to get another segment of the media shut down. You don't see an editorial in the Wall Street Journal saying, you know what, the New York Times and its point of view is anti-American and shouldn't exist. Joe McCarthy is long dead and gone. But in our part of the world, multiple Joe McCarthy's are alive, and they want to keep the debate within specific parameters. That is the media environment. Lastly, there is this whole business of what I consider to be conformity in international on international issues. So, um, and, 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 and that basically requires conspiracy theories. Now, I always like telling this story, and I'll repeat it, and those of you who've heard it from me on other occasions, uh, forgive me for saying it, the vice chancellor of Pakistan's largest university, the Punjab University, is a physicist. He's a physics PhD by the name of Dr. Mujahid Kamran. He even got a Fulbright, in case somebody thinks giving Fulbrights is the way to ch change opinions and win over hearts and minds. He even got a Fulbright in physics to come to the United States. He has written a book recently that says that 9-11 was an American conspiracy to give America an excuse to actually invade Muslim countries. But more important than that, he says that um, there's a cabal of bankers, which we all know is a euphemism, uh, right straight out of Mein Kampf, if I'm not mistaken, that a cabal of bankers controls the UK and the United States. But it control, its instrument of control are microchips that are planted in the heads of people like me, who then do their bidding. This man, wrote this, said this in a speech uh, at the launch of his book a few months ago. He hasn't been removed from his office as vice chancellor, which means the head of the university uh, 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 in Punjab, the biggest university. Now, that basically shows you how conspiracy theories are mainstream. I can, I can, I can, I can understand conspiracy theories coming on, on, on strange blogs in this country. There are many. But very frankly, if the president of um, Georgetown University uh, said something as crazy and nutty as this vice chancellor did, I doubt if he would be president of the university an hour later. If nothing else, his family would show up at his office and say, Daddy, you need to go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> On that note, uh, Jeff Goldberg, columnist for Bloomberg View. Um, sure. You've also reported for the Washington Post, uh, the New Yorker, the Atlantic. Um, you, your career has taken you uh, to many capitals in a in very uh, great number of uh, rough neighborhoods from Beirut to Havana, Karachi, and Islamabad. Talk about, um, Ambassador Akhani has talked about what the media environment is within Pakistan and the kinds of narratives um, that are uh, being put forth. But, are Western journalists able to report the truths out of countries such as Pakistan and some of the other countries that you've covered um, uh, when, when there's such an unfree press uh, environment in those countries? What are your experiences uh, like in those countries? And why don't you kick it off with yeah. Pakistan? Uh, sure. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit worried at the moment because the uh, the microchip that I put in Hussein's <laughs> brain two years ago is malfunctioning in some way. <coughs> really quite disturbed by I, that. I'll, I'll come in for re remedial yeah, yeah, surgery yeah, yeah, later. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yes. Yes. We, 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 we meet at delis around the Washington area and fix the, the um, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect entree because I had, and, and Hussein knows this and we could talk about this, uh, obviously, I had, uh, my last trip to Pakistan, which I, I really think will be the last trip to Pakistan for a while, as Cliff knows. Um, well, it, 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 you know, I, this is, I mean, this is the, the, the short version of, uh, of this is uh, I, I've been going to Pakistan for 15 years or so since, you know, well before 9-11. On this last trip, which was a couple of years ago already, a year and a half ago, um, I was going with the intention of, uh, of trying to understand the, the actual security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons, uh, you know, how they're, how they're stored, command and control issues. And so obviously if you wash up in Islamabad and you start asking questions about the safety of the nuclear weapons, they get um, nervous. And so I realized that I would have only a few days um, 
in which to do that. It wasn't the only goal. I wanted to sort of write about the entirety of the dysfunctional U.S.-Pakistan relationship, but it wasn't the only goal. And, um, and so I had a weird bifurcated experience where I was um, interviewing people from the ISI because there was some level of cooperation and also being followed by the ISI and having my room. I moved two or three times uh, to sort of stay uh, a little bit more difficult to, to track, uh, having room ransacked and being and being followed. And um, what happened is, and this is where it becomes this interesting story about how media behaves in a semi-unfree society, um, it's assumed, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's assumed in Pakistan that many journalists are on the payroll of the ISI, which is, you know, obviously an all-encompassing organization, not as competent as you would think in some areas, but pretty competent in in, in others, not competent in fighting Al Qaeda, but more competent in fighting journalism. Um, the uh, and so and so what what happened about a week or so into this trip is I got a, started getting phone calls from reporters, legitimate report. I mean, I looked up their names on Google. They they were reporters for different Pakistani, a couple of Pakistani outlets in particular. And the questions, uh, you know, I immediately understood what was going on because the questions uh, were all in in line of. So uh, we understand that you're a prominent Zionist leader from America, and we want to do a, a profile of you in our newspaper uh, tomorrow. Do you have a picture we could use? You know, and and so you know, and and and, and, and that was basically the you, you know the intention of a couple of the phone calls. I checked. I, I, obviously, I been through this before. I intuited what was going on, but I I checked with a couple of people I can trust. Um, on matters of security, and they said, "Get to the airport." <laughs> no, because you, you, because if my picture appeared in uh, Urdu language or or, or, or or any any outlet really, um, with with some description of some diabolical Zionist conspiracy visiting Islamabad and, and Pindi, you know, I, I would um, I would have some real security problems. And so this was a they were slow in the uptake. I managed to get some reporting done in between that period, but. Uh, uh, I, sure enough, uh, I mean, I'm not going to be foolish at, at, at my age anymore. I'd be foolish 20 years ago, 15 years ago. But uh, I, I got to the, to the airport uh, because there was no choice. It wasn't whether they would have published something, I don't know. But it, it didn't matter because the, they were signaling. It was, it was pure signal. And so, so there's two lessons out of that, two very brief lessons. One is that in these societies, the intelligence agencies will treat you as an enemy and someone to drive away. And two, the way they will do that is using people we think are legitimate journalists, which obviously feeds into another brief point I would make, which is that, I mean, this goes to the, the mainstreaming. We, uh, uh, you've put it perfectly. We, we, all, we all live in societies with conspiracy theories. It's, the, the issue is not whether people believe ridiculous things. It's how close those ridiculous uh, ideas penetrate, how, how, how far into the society they penetrate. Um, you're exactly right. When it exists on the margins, it's, 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 it doesn't influence reality. But, uh, but when you have leading journalists, leading academics believing these conspiracy theories, rather baroque, complicated conspiracy theories, many of which in, in the greater Middle East have to do with Jews, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're living in an alternate universe. We talk about whether the, whether the newspapers, whether the journalism is, is free or unfree. It's a material point, but another material point is, is that it doesn't matter in a certain way because if they're propagating nonsense freely, um, then, then the people who are reading this and absorbing this are, uh, are not dealing with the same set of what we believe to be observable facts as, 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 as they are. Yeah. Well, I hope sure. you know that one of the accusations against me back home has always been my willingness, quote unquote, uh, to give visas to Zionist agents like you to yes. come to Pakistan as journalists. Yes. And I, I always. And he's amazingly cheap, by the way. That's, I mean, he didn't even this charge. This would be an appropriate time to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my argument always used to be that, you know, if, if a journalist of a major American news outlet applies for a visa, he's a journalist. He's coming to a free democratic country. We are a democracy. 
and he is entitled to come and report on us unless there is a security consideration in which case the Pakistani intelligence service should point out we have this evidence against this person and therefore please do not give him a visa. So have a negative list but don't insist that every visa for every journalist has to be cleared by the security agency. Okay, but let me ask you a question because there are foreign policy implications. How are we to really uh, fully understand what's really happening inside these countries if the Pakistani press, for example, um, has a very difficult time reporting and the Jeff Goldbergs of the world also do. And as we learned um, recent, uh, as we learned back in May, if you're a New York Times reporter, you run the risk of also having your visa revoked and getting kicked out of the country, get, being given 72 hours to leave the country if they suspect that you will be reporting uh, negatively on their elections, as was the case uh, back in May. You, you said on um, The Daily Show this week, I think that American foreign policy needs to be far more sophisticated. The world is not a problem for America to solve. It's a situation for America to understand. And if Americans start understanding other countries, they may be able to build other relationships. How are foreign uh, journalists supposed to operate in an environment like that and tell the real story? Well, for one thing, I have, I have reached the conclusion that the, the, the New York Times reporter, for example, who was sent out, Declan Walsh, uh, he was there for The Guardian for about three years. And, and so very frankly, he was, uh, uh, his visa was canceled because they realized that he now understands what's going on in Pakistan. <laughs> so they're very, very happy to have sort of parachute journalists. And I think what international media in particular, and Americans uh, uh, should focus on this, is to try and build capacity uh, to understand complex societies like Pakistan. For that matter, I'll now add Egypt to it, I'll add Turkey to it. People who have a longer term, you see the pattern is, whether it's your diplomats, or whether it's your journalists, the fear that they'll go native is so strong in this country that you do not like. For example, the, the only American diplomat I've ever met who spoke the language very well, et cetera, et cetera, in his first tenure, served there three years. And then the rest of his career was in China, in Bangladesh. So this man learns the language. He begins to understand the nuance of the culture. He understands that Pakistan is not monolithic, that it's uh, re religiously plural, that it's ethnically plural, that it has historic sort of, you know, diversity within it uh, of people with different ideas about the origins and the function of the country. And when that person understands it, you do not let that person stay too long because, oh gosh, he might go native. So in countries like that, I think there is a case to be made for people who might be willing to go native. And for example, if Declan Walsh has been denied a visa, he can still be an editor, sort of editing the stuff because somebody has to be able to make a distinction between um, BS that is being put out uh, officially, semi-officially, and, uh, and, uh, and, and through individuals who are ostensibly independent, um, and uh, the real facts of the story. Now, that doesn't mean people shouldn't be sympathetic. Of course, reporters should, if they are sympathetic to their subject, they find more facts. So I want journalists, I want uh, reporters, and I want editors who are sympathetic to my country. I want them. I want them to be sympathetic, but the sympathy should not go to the point of not calling out somebody like this vice chancellor uh, that I spoke about and, and not pointing out the utter craziness. So I want to I wanna turn to um, Iran for a minute. Um, my colleague Ali al is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a top Iran expert uh, on the inner workings on um, Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and on the Revolutionary Guard's terrific new book, Ali, called Iran Unveiled, also um, uh, available. Um, Ali, I want to talk about what the what changes there may or may not be, um, we may or may not see in the coming uh, period under a new, the new Rouhani government. You know, during the election, there was much talk about how uh, President Rouhani said he wanted uh, to release political prisoners, uh, but not only that, he specifically talked about wanting to see a change uh, in favor of free speech and media freedom. Since Rouhani was elected, as I understand, about 10 reporters and bloggers have been arrested, and uh, three or more papers have been shut down or suspended uh, publication, um, of course, under pressure from authorities. 
And so while the Foreign Minister Zarif and many others have Facebook and Twitter accounts, um, just last week the secretary of the work group to determine instances of criminal content on the internet said just this week that Facebook is an espionage website and no one has any doubts that it must be blocked. And he added that in fact no request has been made to unblock Facebook. Who sets media policy in Iran? Uh, well, you know, first of all, Toby, your question I think is a bit uh, strange because you you, you say Thank that you. you know, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Rouhani says that he wants to you know give give Iranians freedom of speech. You know, actually, we Iranians do enjoy freedom of speech. The only thing we don't have if, is freedom after speech. You know, <laughs> that, that is the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to when it comes when it comes to to the use of use of modern modern media. Of course, it is, it is no, no, I think, surprise to anyone that, you know, the Islamic Republic and the leaders, they have always used modern technology to advance their own agendas. After all, let's, let's not forget that Ayatollah Khomeini was, was, you know, the innovative revolutionary who used audio or recordings of his own speeches to smuggle them into Iran in order to revolutionize and in order to incite the public, you know, to, to rise against the Shah. What he did not like was to have people using their own cassette recorders distributing materials around. The same thing applies to the Islamic Republic. They like to use Facebook. Mr. Zarif uses Twitter and Facebook and everything else. But at the same time, you know, just 10 days ago, they arrested 16 people in the city of Kerman, far away from, 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 from Tehran, just because they were using Twitter, just because they were using f Facebook. And the accusations made against them was that they were working for, for, for foreign governments. And even more interestingly, every once in a while we have on Iranian television, you know, you here in America, you have American Idol. In, Ameri in Iranian, on Iranian television, we have televised confessions. And you have American Idol, we have co televised confession of the year. People. People make the most outrageous, you know, confessions, saying that, you know, yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm agent for, for this and that, you know, uh, government. One person, one of the co-founders of Iran's intelligence ministry, Mr. Said Hajarian, he confessed that it was Max Weber who made him become a velvet revolutionary. Max Weber, the German, uh, you know, sociologist, one of the fathers of sociology. At the time, you know, and this is after 2009, you know, unrest, the judge, of course, had no idea who Max Weber is. So he screamed, yes, yes, Max Weber is the ringleader. Max Weber is the ringleader. <laughs> These are, this is the things, you know, this is the type of regime that, that, that we are wor working with. Who sets the media rules? Nobody knows because the rules are unclear. According to Iranian legislation, according to the Constitution, there is freedom of speech. But we do not know what are the limits of the freedom of speech. One of the newspapers which was shut down uh, last month, Bahar, it was shut down because an article about a religious issue. It was actually not insulting at all. It was a debate about the role of political and uh, religious leaders. That, you know, the, the journalist was, was summoned to court and it, he, was, he was imprisoned. The editor of the newspaper, he was also imprisoned and the newspaper was banned. Nobody knows what are the limits of freedom of speech when it comes to the press. Nobody knows that. And that is the problem. Who arrested those 16 bloggers who were using Twitter and Facebook account? It was not the police. They were never summoned to court. They were arrested by the Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Organization. So in other words, we have multiple organizations who can allow themselves to take people into custody and force them into do and engage in televised confessions, and they are not responsible. These government agencies. And the text of the law is not telling us what is the limits of freedom of speech. And that, of course, the type of culture this is propagating is the culture of self-censorship. Because if you do not know what the rules are, you end up not expressing yourself. This is how Mr. Rouhani is ruling Iran. Now, I know that, you know, and, and, and let it be, you know, the last point I'm going to make to begin with. In Iran, you know, actually, whenever we have a president elected. By the way, I like that. The last point I'm going to make to begin with. That's a good one. That was great. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> well, you know, we, we Iranians, you know, we are all naturally born, you know, uh, clerics. When we, you give us a podium and we begin preaching, we, 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 we never stop. The, the I thought Iranians were naturally born poets. 
<laughs> that, that too, but my English is not good enough you know, for, 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 for that. So, so the issue was that, you know, they, yes, you know, they, we, 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 we do have all these, these, these problems, but at the same time, you know, Iranians also try to, try, try to fight it. But, but it is completely unclear, you know, who is setting the rules and, and what rules to follow. Okay, but is there, you know, just like the interim agreement that we're looking at on the nuclear front, is there no interim um, f or first steps that Iran can be taking and should be taking with the use of new media? Is there no value to it? Now, uh, the, uh, now, now you are talk, talking about, you know, net activists and journalists or the Iranian government? Sure, both. I mean, isn't this the first step in opening up Iran to all media? Well, you know, I, I do not believe that Mr. Rouhani at all is interested in opening up Iran into, into any type of media. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, uh, some Iranian youth, those 16 bloggers who were arrested, they thought and they believed that a new president also means a change of the nature of the regime. Now, these people, they are young and they are naive. But how can you blame them? There are people in Washington, D.C. who believe that because there is a new president in office in Iran, it also means the change of the nature of the regime. In Iran, they are young and naive. In Washington, D.C., they are Middle-aged and naive. <laughs> um, <laughs> The same. Uh, let, let me just say something. This nature of the regime uh, question is a very important one. And I think that people get deceived. Uh, hospitality, for example, deceives Americans. I mean, you know, you show up, somebody is very hospitable, they're very nice, uh, they're very welcoming. Yes, but that doesn't mean in the heart they're saying, oh, God, Zionist lapdog, you know, I'm just sort of taking him from one place to another, but I have to do it for the sake of my country. So the nature of the regime and what it's telling its own people is important. A lot of times you will notice governments make statements. Uh, and, and, and you remember the joke that people used to make about Yasser Arafat, not joke, but it was, it was a pretty deadly comment that, you know, to understand what he's thinking, you should see what he says in Arabic, not what he sees, says in English. I think that that phenomenon needs to be understood because in many cases that is not understood. What are people telling their own government? I mean, in my book, shameless plug, I point out that, for example, as far back as the 1950s, Pakistani leaders were telling Pakistan's people that America is not our ally. We are not allying with them. We are just, you know, using them to get some military equipment. That was the truth because that's what they wanted to tell their own people. So in case of the Iranian deal, look at what, uh, what Rouhani and company are telling the Iranians. It's our victory, etc., etc. You know, we will get to keep and so we have our options. Options. But if that's what they're telling their people, you should pay attention to what they're telling their people uh, in a managed narrative. Remember, it's all about narrative building. Pakistan has a new movie, by the way. It's called War, W-A-A-R, which literally means the blow or the strike. What's special about it? It's got great action scenes. It's, it's very well made. It's a wonderful movie by all standards by most people. But it has been funded and supported by Pakistan's army's inter-service public relations, which is, you know, usually people will support in facilities, etc., but then you pay a bill. No, this is even funded. But what's the storyline? The storyline is that Pakistan is in trouble because of the terrorists and this and that, etc. But guess at whose behest the terrorists are operating? They are operating at India's behest. And this is all a conspiracy in which the Americans, the uh, sort of, you know, the Israelis, the Indians are all working together with the terrorists to harm the great Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Um, and so in the end, of course, the Pakistani inter-services intelligence and the military basically defeat the, both the terrorists and all that. So some people have been told and they've reported that this is an anti-terrorist movie. It is. But what is the bottom line here? What is the Pakistani public being made to believe as a result of this movie? Who is the real threat to Pakistan? Not the terrorists. It's still India who is using the terrorists. It makes the Pakistani public not understand the Islamist, jihadist, extremist threat. It still makes them feel that there are, okay, so the Taliban and the lashkar e taiba who are sympathetic to Pakistan's regional objectives and are against India, they're good guys. Terrorism per se is not bad. It's the terrorists who are acting on America and uh, Israel and India's behest who are bad. And that divides public opinion and that is essentially, and the fact that it's a movie sponsored by the military shows you what the fundamentals are. So the same applies to Iran. 
try and sometimes understand the fundamentals of the nature of the regime and what they want national consensus to be built about. I'm about to go to the audience for Q&A, but before I do that, Jeff, two quick things. One is, so you follow the Supreme Leader on Twitter, right? Yeah, he doesn't follow me, though. <laughs> Okay. By the way, the thought of, I, I, I'm one person who would like to be arrested for using Twitter because then I could get some work done maybe. It was not a bad idea, right? Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't just ask you very quickly. Yeah, I think he's following one person, the Supreme Leader, which I think is his, he's following his own office. I think. <laughs> Supreme leaders are sources of emulation, so they have followers. They, they don't can't follow, follow anyone. Right. It's, 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 it's theologically impossible. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd be remiss before we get to audience Q&A. Um, if I didn't ask you about some of your reporting on Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera America, and, and I could pick a number of um, questions, but um, my question is really about um, uh, your view on what reporters ought to do before they uh, take on an assignment like working for Al Jazeera or Al Jazeera America, because you wrote that um, those interested in maintaining their integrity while an employee of the Muslim Brotherhood supporting despots who rule Qatar should pursue a story that asks why Al Jazeera's parent company gives a global uh, platform to Yusuf Karadawi, the extremist extremist, w which we talked about. My question is, first of all, answer it whatever way you want, but that raises a very fundamental we're question. Because yeah. we're free here. Yeah. But um, that raises a, a fundamental question about can foreign state-owned media have any credibility or any utility uh, outside its borders. Al Jazeera America is only one of them. You have RT, yeah. right, TV. Larry King's got a show there. You've got, uh, you know, China, CCTV. Oh, Why RT is that? sort of the caricature of Al Jazeera America in a way. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a sledgehammer, and Al Jazeera America is a, is a scalpel. And we don't know what the operation they're using that scalpel for is yet. That's sort of the odd thing. I mean, y you know, it, it's... It, I, I start by saying that it's a rough climate for journalists and people have to make a living and they have families and if the despotic monarchy of gutter wants to open a TV network in America, I, I, how can you sit and condemn a journalist uh, for going to take a job? On the other hand, I wouldn't take that job. Um, and I've been, um, it's kind of this, uh, it, it's almost risen to the level of, a, of, a, of a, an intel operation. I, I, I've been called by four or five different Jewish employees of Al Jazeera America over the last few months, uh, basically in a in a completely spontaneous <laughs> uh, uh, campaign to convince me that I'm wrong about Al Jazeera America. It's actually it doesn't have any sort of agenda other than telling the news, uh, and and you know I don't they don't understand why I'd be critical of a guttery owned TV network in. In America, and what I explained to them, I mean, I use. Anyway, truth be told, I have heard that there is a Goldberg strategy at Al Jazeera. True? It, it, it sounds great. Yeah, I, 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 I'll take. Attention. You know, I take it as a compliment. Put it that way. I take it as a compliment that mm -hmm. someone thinks that uh, I, I'm, I'm worth convincing. Uh, I'm not going to be convinced. And I'll give you a, a, an interesting middle, non Middle East, non non Muslim Brotherhood. A small example about the, the dilemma of working as a journalist for a state-owned media outlet, especially a non-democratic state-owned media outlet, um, Al Jazeera America, which does, you know, I, I, very few people have seen it, obviously. Um, I, I've watched some of it. It's, it's mainly good, dutiful reporting about domestic American issues. You have to ask yourself the question, of course, why do the owners of Gutter find domestic weaknesses of the United States so interesting and worthy of, uh, 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 of discussion? Uh, but, but lay that aside, the, um, the example that I use to people who call me to say that we are, we're a good network is, is the following. They've done interesting climate change work. You know, they, 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 they've looked at the problem seriously. They probably do more reporting on climate change issues than many other uh, networks on, the, on, the, uh, on cable. Um, but one thing they haven't done any in-depth reporting on is the fact that their owners, the, the, the government of Gutter, Gutter itself is the, is the uh, produces more greenhouse gas per, uh, per capita than any other country in the world. Gutter's uh, greenhouse gas emissions are three times that of the United States, and we're no slackers in producing 
greenhouse gas. So, so you, you know, you, I, I bring this up and I say, when are we going to? I'll change my mind about this when you do critical reporting about the Muslim Brotherhood, when you do, uh, when you do critical reporting about climate change, when you do critical reporting about uh, domestic guttery issues. I mean, you could spend an entire hour, obviously, in investigative journalism, just looking at, and then we've, I think you've talked about this already. You know, stadium building for 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 uh, for the World Cup. Uh, but these are things that are not going to happen. Every media company, private or publicly owned or state owned, obviously has areas of sensitivity with a non-democratic oil producing, greenhouse gas emission, uh, emission producing, uh, journalist arresting, non-free society owning your network. I just think that the problems are too many. To, you, you can't really go, go work for them and think that you're operating as a completely free journalist. Uh, but, but, but just to add quickly, I mean, government controlled media or government owned media is slightly different. I mean, there are BBC is government owned, you know, Deutsche Welle is government owned, mm -hmm. and, and, and so we have, so, so, so I, I do sympathize with the journalists, and uh, especially given the Middle Eastern environment, people do feel that Al Jazeera has kind of opened up the, 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 the space somewhat, but, you know, some of Jeff's points are really definitely worth considering uh, as to uh, how can you, I mean, should there be freedom within limits, and then who sets those limits? And if you accept that whole notion of freedom within limits, is it freedom anymore? Like and as soon as you I modify think, the word freedom, exactly, it's not freedom. Exactly. That's the point I was trying to make. You can't. I think, yeah. I think those issues will come up at Q&A. Sir, first question. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Nishar Chaudhry with Pakistan American League. I have an observation and a question. Uh, Ambassador Hakami mentioned about uh, a visa problem. I think this is the discretion of any ambassador to give visa to anybody. Uh, I took 276 Pakistani Americans from USA to India. And it was the discretion which was exercised by the ambassador of India, uh, Ambassador Ronan Senan. And he gave me 276 visas in 48 hours. And he said, I'm exercising my discretion, and I'm overruling so many manuals which are not important. So when you exercise your discretion, this is nothing. There's no reason to accuse you for anything. Thank you very much. The Tell other, that to the, the Pakistani the president. Other thing <laughs> is that, the other thing is that uh, while sitting thousands of miles away uh, in a country which is governed through institutions, we are talking of countries which are governed through individuals. So here we have a big gap. In, in those countries, in Pakistan, the politicians always fall on their feet. In this country, they always fall on their heads. You know why, why this is like this and why it happens. In that's that true. country, people have more general knowledge than knowledge. This country has knowledge. My question to you is, in these circumstances, uh, and uh, Ambassador mentioned about uh, uh, the smuggling of nuclear weapons by Dr. Kadir Khan, and which, which he w who was never charged, and he continued to remain a hero in Pakistan. My question is that in spite of all this kind of background, what are your recommendations to bring these countries uh, in an alignment to a point which can diffuse the situation and they can start working together to bring the region more peaceful and make this relationship which is complex and difficult a little easier. Thank you. And as you're answering, I see the next question right over here. Mike, great, please. Um, I, think, I think that in case of the United States and Pakistan is what I understand your question to be. Look, I mean, the United States obviously cannot change other countries overnight and shouldn't, but the U.S. policy should take all the facts on the ground into account and not assume that, it's, uh, that it is not reinforcing some of the dysfunctions in those societies. So whether it's dealing with Qatar or whether it's dealing with Turkey or whether it's dealing with Pakistan, it's about being mindful and then create the space for greater freedom in all those societies. Uh, in case of Pakistan, in case of Turkey, there's considerable internet penetration now, for example. And that can always be used to create more space for a counter-narrative, a, a, a counter-conspiracy theory narrative 
to make people understand how the world really is rather than how they've been told and brought up uh, uh, to believe that the world is. And engagement at the political and diplomatic level obviously should continue, but it should not be based on uh, false quid pro quos. Uh, and throughout the 1980s, the American assumption was that by giving conventional weapons to Pakistan, they are discouraging Pakistan from making nuclear weapons. Well, it was a wrong assumption because they did not understand the Pakistani desire and commitment to having a nuclear uh, device to be able to compete or stave off uh, India. And so things like that should be avoided. And in case of the media, just start understanding what is, I mean, there's, you know, you've lived with propaganda from others or you've lived with conspiracy theories from others. At least you've known that they were conspiracy theories and they were propaganda. Uh, I don't know if anybody has noticed the Ministry of Defense in Pakistan made a presentation to the parliament through uh, the minister, which said only 68 civilians have been killed in the last five years by drone strikes. 68. Well, guess what? If that is the case, you know, we apologize for 68 people and we would be happy to compensate their families for this erroneous uh, sort of death caused by our people. But can you kindly stop the propaganda about drones killing thousands of people? So you can't have both at the same time. And that's the neat work that needs to be done in Washington that is not always done. Hopefully, Cliff, you and some others might start doing that. Sure. Ali, follow-up comment and then Jeff. You know, I, I think that, you know, there is a huge degree of concern among the uh, Iranians that now that the United States government is trying to reach some kind of accommodation with the government of the Islamic Republic, that the U.S. government is ready to sell us out. I am begging you. I am begging each and every one of you not to sell us out. Don't stop broadcasting programs in Persian language to Iran. We need free press. We need a surrogate press which can give the Iranian people access to information. Don't stop Radio Free Europe. There is need for information in Iran. Don't sell us out regardless what's happening with the nuclear deal. Thank you. Jeff, follow up? Yeah. Um, uh, to respond very practically to that point. I, it's a, a simple rule that if uh, that I have, that if, if Erdogan is against something, I'm probably for it. And he's obsessed with the uh, nefarious influence of Twitter. Um, so I would say, I mean, as a matter of policy, that the U.S. should do what it can to promote the use uh, and facilitate uh, platforms like Twitter in uh, in countries like this. It does. It it democratizes. There's a lot of bad information that goes out on Twitter, but it empowers people. Uh, and if you read, I mean, really, just Google it. It's hysterical because Erdogan is the pre, you know he's the leader of of, of a major state. Uh, he's absolutely obsessed with the perfidious influence of Twitter, and that should be a clue about what he's worried about. Next point, Mike. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mike Kraft, I'm a former State Department official and also a former foreign correspondent. And I'd like to raise a conspiracy issue, uh, which both of you raised. And first of all, ambassadors, of having been a resident correspondent for news agencies, I agree with you about journalists being parachuted in. It's very hard to get a good f flavor of a situation if you just come in briefly. With all due respect to you, Jeff. but. You know, the, the, the South Asia, particularly Pakistan, and <clears throat> to a lesser extent, as you mentioned, Iran, seems so rife with conspiracy theories. I, we used to have a little competition in my office between the South Asia Foreign Service officer and the Middle East on which area produced the conspiracy theory of the week. And to my surprise, it was Pakistan and India that tended to win out most of the time. I wonder what your insights are. Why are these regions so prone to it? and the governments tend to foster it. Is it a political thing or is it something cultural? Well, it's, it's, it's both. Uh, it's a feeling that, you know, we are more important and powerful than we, uh, uh, than we are allowed to be. And so therefore you have to, you have to have an explanation for your decline. Exactly. I mean, if you think about it, you know, the Mughals were a great empire and then they lost it. Well, guess what? I haven't found somebody in our part of the world who's written a book comparable to say, Gibbons, Rise and Fall of the, a Roman Empire to try and understand what happened. And then there was the col experience of colonization. So it's a great way, it's a great explanation. It's like saying, you know, I'm, I'm coughing because of the cold, not because of my smoking. 
uh, um, it, it's that kind of attitude. And then it has been fostered and nurtured by our governments as a instrument of policy. Um, Pakistan was an American ally and uh, uh, basically the alliance was based on the idea that we'll get weapons from America, but primarily to be able to fight India. Well, but then uh, it should have been understood that that could not be sustained because America was not going to encourage Pakistan to fight India. So then there had to be an explanation for what happened uh, uh, and why the relationship didn't work out to Pakistan's advantage. And that explanation could only be a conspiracy theory. And lastly, the religious uh, extremists, their best bet is conspiracy theories uh, because uh, they're living in a modern world for which some of their ideas have no relevance. Uh, um, and, and so uh, they come up with conspiracy theories every now and then. So it's, it's all three of those, a cultural factor, a, a political factor, and a... Um, and a factor of, of, of governments and regimes maintaining control. On the cultural side, you will note that on the Indian side, things have changed since you were there. Uh, post 92, when India has become more economically, a little bit more vibrant and open, etc., uh, conspiracy theories have declined. Uh, they've risen in Pakistan further as Pakistan's economy has declined. As far as the Middle East is concerned, uh, by the way, on the subject of who would win that competition or where there are greater conspiracy theories, the competition is ongoing. Uh, <coughs> and, and, and sometimes I think Pakistan being in both regions ends up winning because it has the conspiracy theories of the Middle East and this it has the conspiracy theories of South Asia. Okay, so um, I've got about five questions, except I'm only allowed one. So if you guys all promise to do your questions the size of a Twitter message, I will take one in the back. One right here, and Human in the back, right? Twitter size, one sentence questions, go. Uh, Chris yep. Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy. I'll try to do it in 140 characters. I'm wondering if Jeffrey Goldberg would be willing to answer the question he posed but didn't answer on why it is the Qatari authorities find it so interesting to intensively cover the weaknesses of the US because this is a feature across Russia today, CCTV. It's really focused on the weaknesses of the US why might they be so interested in doing that? Great question. And also, before you answer, can we get Human's question? And the gentleman right here promised me Twitter size, 140 characters. Go. Um, Human, back to you with VOA Persian. I have a question about how public opinion organizations like Gallup are uh, being manipulated by the regimes, like uh, the regime in Tehran. Um, every now and then they go to Iran and do an um, opinion survey and uh, uh, the result is that 99% of the um, Iranian society support the nuclear program or they blame um, the United States for Iran's uh, collapsing economy because of sanctions. And I just want to know what's behind that and what's the incentive Great. of reputable organizations like Gallup to go there and do this kind of service because we know that Great public, question. public Great opinion question. surveys Twitter are size. for... Uh, <laughs> Come on, we get... That was nine and last tweets. question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the topic is regime media, but there's also media distortion uh, of a massive scale in organizations like the Aspen Institute with an $80 million budget. Jeffrey, I've met you there. You know what I'm talking about. The no, way I don't. Panels, the way the panels are stacked okay. in creating issues, there's not a spectrum of issue discussion. It's very narrow, and it's on one side, and the formation is biased. It's not like this panel. Got it. And I would like Good. to comment on, in the United States, we have various forums what where uh, issues are really not well uh, put together because of the contents of the panel. Thank, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you for the short questions. I'm going Panelists, to take the last question. Sh the short American answers. On pick, the panel. pick one that you want. Quick. Uh, look, you Americans should be grateful for the fact that while you have one for, uh, organization that you don't agree with, you can always help create another one that you do <laughs> agree with. So, 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 so the both, bo that creates an environment. Yes, there are certain institutions that you may not like. There are certain there are certain newspapers and uh, uh, editorial pages I read and I say, what the heck are they writing? But then I have the choice of reading another one where I say, oh good, okay, that, that, that kind of satisfies my life. And so therefore, uh, do not compare that to say, the kind of controls that are existing in societies uh, where the distortion is deliberate and the distortion is a total distortion of fact to the point where it's impossible for them to find the fact. I mean, most Pakistanis think 
America abandoned Pakistan after uh, Afghanistan. It actually didn't fully abandon. President Bush Sr. was very sorry for having to impose sanctions which were related to Pakistan not fulfilling its promise on the nuclear question. Pakistani people don't know that. They've never been told that. And so that, that, that is a very big difference. At least you have alternatives here. I'll let somebody else answer sure. the other question. Jeff and then Ali. Uh, well, two questions directed at me I can't answer. I don't speak for the Aspen Institute. Uh, I think it's a pretty good conference, but again, I think Hussein makes the, the, the cogent point that if you don't like the Aspen Ideas Festival, then go to Vail and start one there. No, I, I, seriously, it's not a bad, I, I don't, I, we can talk about it later, but I don't know. Um, on, on the other question about Al Jazeera's motive, uh, uh, Gutter's motives in, in doing this, you know, it's purely speculative, and I, I would imagine that you have the same thoughts that, that I have. Um, you know, I heard in the, in the last panel, someone at the very end, I think, uh, said, you know, the question was, you know, is, is there, are they trying to advance the Muslim Brotherhood ad agenda? And I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's ostentatious like that. I don't think it's so direct. Um, I, I think in their own minds, what they're doing is providing a platform for non-American narratives. Um, or, or even anti-American narratives. Uh, and, and so one way to go about doing that is to highlight the, the flaws and weaknesses of American society to, to, to uh, if, you're, if you're thinking you could actually manipulate people, to show them all of the problems in their own society and sort of raise the question, why are you being engaged in our society and judging us when you have all these problems? But again, it, it remains a mystery. They're certainly not doing it to make money. We know that. Concerning Gallup and opinion polling in Iran, well, I think there are more efficient ways of finding out how Iranians think, especially when it comes to America. Uh, take a look at the most desirable country for Iranians to study in. It's the United States of America. The most desirable country to do business in. That's again the United States of America. And also, uh, two weeks ago, uh, one of the editors of uh, the website Entehab was actually arrested. Why? because he had allowed commentary on a story you know, on a website uh, about uh, Iran-US uh, uh, rapprochement. Uh, and an overwhelming majority of the commentaries were extremely positive and extremely critical of the Islamic Republic of Iran. That, I think, tells us much more about the mentality of Iranians and the state of mind and political opinions than some of the results that you see from Gallup.